We have come to the last uh, and the most important uh, session of the workshop. And uh, unlike in all the previous sessions, and this is a session where uh, everyone who has presented was not been able to say anything or supposed to speak out and then uh, say something about how we can take this uh, rather humble program. It sounds very ambitious, but as we move forward and we find more and more people getting interested in this issue, it doesn't sound so ambitious as much as uh, for a much more collaborative effort. And that is the issue that I want to initiate a discussion on. So I got some four or five themes on which we can together reflect upon on taking this work forward. I propose it, but without that, you can sign your suggestions just to these four, but we can develop more. One is, uh, one of the questions that has uh, occurred to me over the last two days is this very traditional dichotomy, which is very unique to Indian uh, history, that the practice of writing history. Is that people who know a lot more about text, they do not bother or lack of training or exposure or a lack of sensitivity towards what does social history mean, what does history writing mean, what does society according to the traditional divisions of social history, political history, economic history. So people who know text, they don't feel like or they don't feel the necessity to engage with that kind of historical history. Whereas people who do social, economic and political history train in conventional history departments in the universities, be it in central universities or be it in regional universities. There has been a certain aversion towards engaging substantively into textual uh, sources. So how do we bridge these two traditions is something that we need to uh, think about uh, more carefully. And uh, as we all know, there are no shortcuts to this bridging uh, traditions, the business of bridging traditions. So the only way is to take the pedagogic route, design curriculums, have consistent, regular interactions between the two traditions, people who are interested in it, and then try and learn from each other, I think. And this is one such forum which inadvertently turned out to be one such an exercise. And we would like to continue a similar such uh, work. And uh, we need to be able to take such initiatives, not at the South India <coughs> level, not at the, but at each and every uh, state level, I think. We need to think about it. So, we would really appreciate if you can suggest something as to how to do that. That's one of And in terms of uh, programmatic priorities, I mean, how to take this forward, there are four elements. One is uh, building the archive itself. Because in our experience, some of this Kamil uh, or Malayalam or any other language manuscripts, the moment it says Ganita, they are not even catalogued. Okay, they are all still lying, lying uncatalogued, unexplored, unpatched, bundled up, being destroyed. So there is a sense of urgency to which we need to respond to that. Because it's already been 150 years since this tradition called Indian mathematics you know, was began to be studied in different languages. 150 years has passed by and we still don't know what kind of sources, what kind of primary records that has been left behind by people, practitioners, scholars, students and teachers and how do we build an archive conscious of the fact that these are real people these are real people making, creating and transmitting knowledge and how do we value that practice with that perspective how do we reconstruct such an archive how do we do that collaboratively and together that's the first thematic thread and within the premises of this program that's how we want to approach the project. That's one. And then as you all know, suddenly in the last five years, there is a digital boom. Everybody is digitizing manuscripts. And therefore, more and more agencies are coming in into the digitization business. It's even called business now. <coughs> more and more people are entering into digitization business. The custodians, the traditional custodians of manuscripts are becoming more and more reticent. Oh, who are these people? Suddenly everyone, why is everyone coming to take away our resources? Why is it that you know, six manuscripts 
cannot be shared. So there is this emerging tension. Sometimes it is understandable. There are people who have misused resources, and therefore the fear and the hesitation and the reticence on the part of the custodians of uh, manuscript libraries and collections is understandable. But on the other hand, there are also efforts like what we are trying to do, which is consciously train and study and learn from train a whole new generation of people to engage in this kind of primary historical material. So there are initiatives like this. There is also contradiction between traditional libraries and the digitization efforts. Then how do we resolve this contradiction in the most pressing question that is emerged? In our own experience, in the last two years, we are trying to do a pilot survey, which is which manuscript is there in which library, so that we all can publish it on a note. If we need to study Kanakadiga in Malayalam or Tamil or any other language, this, this is the place where we need to go. That's one way of doing it. Now, we also know that this is a digital world, everybody wants to keep download everything and then read instantly of that. So, even if you don't want to read, you want to download at least. Right? So, then, in that case, then what you do is, there is this thing, I mean, that's why I need to seek your opinion and all these things. Which is, is it just enough to say, okay, this library has this manuscript, whoever is interested, assuming that someone will get interested after 150 years. No one has got interested so far. Assuming that someone will get interested in the future, I just say, put up a database in public domain, like the website that Tamil showed on the first day. We put it up and then say, expect people to go to the library, search, sit there, transcribe, and make that conventional hardware to go and read it and then work on it. That's one way. The second way, which is what every agency uh, is now doing, which is to Centralize them. So if I am doing mathematics, somebody else is doing sculpture, shilpa, sastra, somebody else is doing no, A, B, C, D, like that. You thematically organize an archive and then coordinate and centralize them as one central repository. Not central, but several of could be one thing. Then how do we fix this? Is it the second appropriate model feasible? Can we possibly do this? The government oriented manuscripts library. Madras whose repository was supposed to come here and unfortunately could not make it. But we also know that for the last two and a half years we have been trying to get access. We have printed catalogs of Tamil, Malayalam, Telugu, Kannada, Arabic, Persian manuscripts in the government oriented manuscripts have been shown. So you have to glean through everything and then say which is all related to mathematical practice. Yeah? From the printed catalog we did a survey. But then before I put it up and publish it in the public domain, I need to go physically inspect whether the manuscript actually does exist anymore. Because the printed was 1954. Right? We need to go and see if the manuscript actually exists for real. What condition is it? It says 54 leaves. Are there still 54 leaves or only 24 left of the insects have eaten away? So we need to be able to, but for that we have not had permission. With two years. So how do you make this database useful, relevant and public so that where we can train, generate an interest among students and scholars to turn their attention towards the vernacular in the two unexplored sources and how do we make an archive that can actually become history. It's not just a bad effort to digitize and accumulate a huge purpose of material so that you know, just to show up, just to say we have also done this, we are not here to do that. Then how do we take these two processes simultaneously? Training, learning, studying and writing the history of vernacular mathematical practices has to go along with creating a database and a public archive. So how do we do that together in the second theme that we are interested in? I really appreciate you all can reflect on this real problem which we are facing now. The third thing is, as you have seen, most of the presentations did talk about question of measurements, which comes almost naturally uh, to you know, why is there diversity, how do we understand the problem of standardization, who authored standardization efforts, is it the state, is it the village advocate, how do you situate, which register, where do you say, who is the agency for standardization, just because the state said, in my kingdom it will be 80 feet, just you pronounce an order one fine morning, 
they, everybody can follow the 18 feet or only the village accountant job to convert every measure into the 18 feet. How does standardization work in the practice? The computational techniques emerge during the interface between the royal order and the practitioner. How did the state and the practitioner speak to each other? So there are real historical questions that we need to ask and the most important is the person that has at least personally struck me as the most uh, valuable person to follow and committed to the question is how do we then engage with the question of social segregation in a society like ours where caste like institutions actually not just mediate but actually segregate people from access, accessing knowledge then a discipline like mathematics supposed to be the most universal of all knowledge systems was it actually universal? In what kind of practice? What register was it universal? In what register it was not universal? When you can't even access knowledge because you were born in a particular caste, you were able, you were condemned to live in the, you know, outside of the village just because you were born in a particular class. Then uh, how do you say mathematics is universal when the ma say mathematics is not even available to you? Since when have you faced this problem in the society? How do we know that this mathematics is universal? How do you make it universal? What has been the history of this? So there are so many questions that we need to know where we still have in a position to collect the resources which will enable us to ask these questions. So coming to this measurement area, how do we glean the epigraphic survey like we have started doing using the data <coughs> to the extent possible? How do we map the diversity in measurements? in relation to the availability of skills, practices and techniques even though it belongs to a very particular society how do we relate and map existing practices to existing skills and then situate the two together into context of education like the like Tindy schools or you know, monastic educational centers how do we bring education and all these things together in the second uh, area and uh, one thing that Professor Subrayu and uh, team has already done, we have not had the time to demonstrate it to you, but we will at some point share the link and I will appreciate feedback on that as well. Which is to how to visualize this diversity. It's one thing to say we can make series of presentations like individuals or articles and then books are not okay, you know, using uh, all the published inscriptions and unexplored inscriptions under the Chola group. This is the kind of measurements which we can, you know, write an article. Only those follow will be able to read and understand. It. So what we are looking for is a pedagogic resource, an educational resource, uh, which we can take into schools, which we can take into colleges, students, and etc. This is the diversity. How do you visualize such diversity? Therefore, the production of an historical atlas. You all must be familiar with the idea of an historical atlas. So we are trying to do an historical atlas of diverse different measurement units in, in South India. So we would like your cooperation. So we would like your cooperation on the making of an historical atlas. So we want to also talk about that. And uh, the fourth important uh, point that I want your opinion is also uh, to carry forward the work which is uh, Certain key areas which is which nobody is ever going to touch. We know for sure. Like for instance, Islamic practices even in uh, South India. There are some minors, somebody is interested in it. That doesn't mean rigorously following up and working on it. So how do we convert interest into actual work? Things. So for instance, can we then follow the journey of the Pulasa Talisa in South India? Where was it trained? Who taught it? Who translated it? Who got trained in it? How, why was Pulasa that Kanaka Dihara mutual language simultaneously taught? Who were the practitioners? What is the social context in which these practitioners operate? So we have to pick up specific things like this and before time runs out, then how do you make, make such kind of questions and work possible? So these are the four thematic areas that I thought I will put up in front of you to seek your opinion, feedback and suggestions. So please uh, speak up. Roy also has a few things to add, then we can have a discussion. Okay, so I want to be uh, a little provocative. I want to start, let's say, by saying that my 
mathematics is not interesting. Mathematics is boring. Okay, as opposed to uh, what I heard from uh, what you said, uh, that uh, uh, mathematics is fun. No, forget about it. Mathematics is boring. I, I have a PhD in mathematics. I can, I'm a professional. No, mathematics is boring. Forget about it. We are here to do history. And history is not about mathematics. History is about people. And therefore, whenever you look at the text, whenever you look at the uh, 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 writing on a wall or a copper plate, you have to ask the question. Otherwise, what you get is something which is abstract, non-localized, non-historicized. You get the same kind of mathematics that you can find uh, in China, in Babylonia, in Arabic countries, in Persia, in uh, uh, Western Europe. Uh, you can find it from 2000 before Christ up until this very day. If you just look at the problem that you're getting, you won't get anything very good. So we need to ask about the people. And therefore, when we look at the text, we should always, if it's available, if we are lucky, Look at the colophon. Look if there's a credit. I wrote it in this house, in this village. This is the first question. Is the writer, can you figure out the, the profession of the writer? Is he a teacher? Is he a practitioner? Is he uh, uh, doing it out of uh, intellectual curiosity or is it something practical? Look at the handwriting. Is this a student who is copying his own textbook as part of the study? Or is it a professional? Or is it a paid scribe who copies for other people? You can sometimes see it from the hand type. Look, look at the language carefully, look at the dialect. This is something that unfortunately I cannot do. Uh, I wish I could, but look at the, look at the uh, uh, phonology, look at the morphology, look at the syntax. You can often find clues as to where, when, what kind of people wrote or copied. Look at the bundle. Is this mathematical text together with other non-mathematical texts or other mathematical texts? Or what kind of other mathematical texts? Look at the distribution of the, of the text. Uh, how many copies can you find? Where can you find? Without this question, we cannot situate the knowledge. And uh, if we don't situate the knowledge, don't we get this, this abstract knowledge you can find everywhere and you won't get anything uh, interesting. So, this is something that, that I wish to hear more about. I know the situation we are in. We are in a virgin territory, text that almost no one bothered to look at, almost no one bothered to copy. Okay, but now we should move also to the next stage and ask about where, when, why the people uh, decided to write this or that, or that text. Why they chose this text. They had 100,000 other texts they could copy, but they copied this one. This problem and not 100,000 other problems. If they, if they copy the text because they thought it was historically interesting, because uh, they had some sort of intellectual scholarly interest, because it was part of the school curriculum, because they needed it for their own daily kind of calculations, uh, calculation work. But at the same time, do not assume that just because someone copies a certain problem, it means that this problem is very relevant to their own life. If, if you find a problem about trading uh, uh, fabric, it doesn't mean that this uh, fabric trader wrote it. Maybe someone who just uh, copies by inertia the available source, and then it's about Trading fabric, and uh, actually, this is not something that is interesting for this specific purpose. Maybe uh, doing a kind of problem is not about needing to do it or uh, finding the knowledge useful. Maybe it's just about showing off. Look at this very complicated, very interesting, very strange problem I can solve. All these different motivations have to come into the analysis when you uh, uh, doing it. Uh, of course, analysis of sources is, is very, very important in terms of trying to figure out where the knowledge comes from. Because people usually don't make knowledge of the public thing there, they build on existing sources. And then there is a very, uh, there's a trap that's very easy to fall into. I found my problem in source X, I found
found my problem in source Y. Source X is earlier, therefore the, the, the problem came from source X into source Y. But it's much too easy. It could be that this problem also appears in many other texts, in many other regions, in many other cultures, and then it could have many other sources. Should also bear in mind that not all sources are written. We know that we find the same problems in uh, China, Babylonia, uh, Greece, and the Arabic world, where in, in few periods we know that there is no written communication between those cultures. So people learn a certain problem, learn a certain story, and then tell it again in another language. And you have translation without textual reference. So in order to understand the kind of text that we are, that we are analyzing, uh, it's not enough to look at the specific text that we are, that we are working on. Uh, if you're working about collections of problems, which is what I'm most interested in, there are many collections of problems around uh, you think that, you come, that this problem comes from the reality? Look also at the Bakshan manuscript. There are edited versions, it's easy. Look also at the Garika uh, Sara Kamadi, giant text of the century. If you find it both in reality and Karikakara, I guess 75% you will find it also in Bakshan and Garika Sara Kamadi. So uh, be very aware of this context. And also, look at other cultures. Is it an international problem or a local problem? And again, there are good collections that you can find, and if you don't know how to find them, ask me, I will try to help you. Uh, <clears throat> also, if you need inspiration for uh, understanding social history of mathematics, I think the, the best source would be uh, the work done, maybe this will surprise some of you, about Babylonian mathematics. The best social history of mathematics that I know comes from there. So look at the work of Elinor Robson, look at the work of Jens Boyer. You will find a very refreshing social kind of approach and analysis to uh, mathematics, which you can then import with or without many different changes that adapt to the local context uh, in order to figure out what is going on. So uh, the bottom line is, if you're just looking at the text, what you will find is not new. What you will find is what people found uh, already uh, over the last 200 uh, years of uh, researching uh, history. Look at the social context, look at the people. I know it is very, very hard sometimes, but uh, we are not uh, paid to do uh, easy work. We are paid to do hard work. This is our challenge. First, uh, to start with, um, regarding the textual uh, sources, text, which is here and which is there. So I just, when I was listening to the presentation by our Kerala colleagues, they also mentioned about Kanaka Gara. And many of these uh, verses, which I can read and which they have known, they are all similar to the verses found in Tamil Kanaka. There seems to be a lot of uh, relation between these. Maybe there is a common source of the nature of borrowing, we do not know. So, some people who are uh, quite at, uh, who are doing uh, work in this field and join together and make uh, some kind of cooperative uh, comparison. So that would be, I think, uh, very useful. Because uh, now we have a lot of these manuscripts, Kanakada manuscripts. So there's an area which have been so far approved by anybody, any scholar. This is the area of 
Vedic sacrifice and the mathematics involved in it. Making the bricks, making the city itself. These are all very, very important. Uh, many superstitions are involved in this case. If you, if, if you cannot use all the bricks you make, uh, it will affect your life, your period of life, etc. etc. Like that. So, exact number of bricks should be made. If you want 100, 1000, 650 bricks, and that should be calculated prior to the beginning. The, uh, the, the measurement of the kiti is made from the length of the, the, the height of that man. He, he is Yajamara. Yajamara who performs the Vedic sacrifice. He stands like this. Then his height is straight. From this height, uh, there are some calculations and it is from this calculation that the measurement of the GD is made. So, there is a higher knowledge of uh, geometrical uh, knowledge involved in the making of the earth. And this involves a large number of mathematical uh, formulas, uh, divisions are there, uh, multiplications are there, uh, additions are there, subtraction. Everything is involved in this kiddie uh, making, making of the kiddie. This has not been studied so far. Only one, uh, one uh, volume or two, a, a two volume work has been brought out uh, in 72 or so. That is, uh, that is available to the Agni, Agni, two volumes. In which Fristar has, in, uh, has given some uh, elements of uh, knowledge, mathematical knowledge, etc. Also, we have uh, given that, and uh, uh, I, have, I have contributed one paper to this volume. And MGS Narayanan was uh, the head of the department at that time in uh, Calicut University. He, has, he was, had a very prominent role in conducting this uh, uh, ritual, etc. This uh, has created some kind of uh, records. But uh, Yeah, there is a lot of uh, materials available in some uh, Nagundi households uh, and that should be brought. That has to be, we have to do some uh, work, uh, but Amar will be uh, the ideal man to do it because uh, his grandfather was uh, a, a specialist in this aspect. So, uh, this Vedic mathematics practiced by the Mudris in Kerala, not only Kerala, uh, Karnataka, the Brahmins also practice the same thing, uh, Tamil Brahmins also uh, practice the same thing. So, we have to uh, enquire, make enquiries into that area also. This is one area which has not been properly studied so far. In the, with regards to your suggestion, uh, I was fortunate to work with Professor K. V. Sharma on a science textile science a project. So this survey is basically a survey that covered the manuscripts available on scientific topics uh, in the repositories of only Kerala and Tamil Nadu, not all India, only Kerala and Tamil Nadu. That itself took us more than six, seven years work. 
So what we did is we, apart from the printed catalogs, we went to, there are, it is astonishing to know that there are more than 270 private collections in Kerala itself. We, we don't have a good survey of Tamil Nadu, but in Kerala, all these uh, elements are identified and it is, this book, Scientific Textiles, after it is published, it is not available, but those who are interested, I can share them a PDF copy. And this is having a part architecture, uh, music, Ayurveda, all are there. There is one chapter on mathematics, astronomy and mathematics. But unfortunately, it discovers only the text in Sanskrit. I think after hearing these two days, I felt that there should be a proper because this vernacular usually it is neglected, not much importance is given. So I think we should uh, definitely try to bring up a survey of the vernacular text in maths. So this was uh, in mathematics, was one of my interests also. So this is neglected area. So I think it will be interesting because uh, these elements are noted there, but only Sanskrit works were given attention at that time. So definitely in this collection, my Kerala friends are here, they can help you for the Malayalam part and Tamil Nadu some friends from here can help. I think uh, because most of the income, uh, they don't even keep, unfortunately they don't even keep a list of manuscripts available with them. So we were forced to take out the manuscript, physically check and put it back. So we may also be lucky enough to do that. But uh, Professor Pushwatham and I from the Calicut University, uh, that is another good source uh, uh, to know. So this Pushwatham and I in Calicut University, this all 274 Ilam manuscript collection, he personally visited and he did a survey. But sir, unfortunately Calicut University had not given enough importance for the work we did and this is kept in the Alamara, but unfortunately now in my recent visits, I am not even able to locate those notebooks. There are five volumes which he physically visited all these 274 elements and took a list. And he left a list there also. Some had lost, some still are having. So I think Kerala friends can use this science source in uh, manuscript in Sanskrit to locate those elements. And you can help this uh, project by providing the providing a list of vernacular text on mathematics. I think from your side you can do Tamil. Once we have this, then we can think of a digitization and uh, I think it will be a very interesting thing if this project can go forward to bring up all the vernacular mathematical text in one place. But unfortunately with the government organizations inside, I also move in that way like uh, what you mentioned for ORI, uh, the GOML Madras. But I think uh, to get all the maths related to mathematics from that institution at a time may not be very easy, but the private collection, I think, definitely we could concentrate. So that way, this, it may be very helpful. I think uh, another point to mention is uh, when I had a long discussion with uh, Sainaba, who is in charge of the Oriental Manuscript Library. You all have to know that this manuscript library is holding more than 65,000 manuscripts. So it's a great collection. I think the, there are several Malayalam manuscripts too. I think the cinema will be definitely helpful for us to uh, have manuscripts and also a survey from that manuscript level. Thank you. Calicut University Manuscript Library is well cataloged. The catalog is available and uh, uh, only, only a hand with the list, sir. No, no, I have that is, that is, that is I have, I have I, two volume catalog with me printed catalog. That is a descriptive catalog of only selected items. Yeah, not yeah. Only mm -hmm. But we have a list available that so you can recruit somebody there. I think definitely we will encourage our friends to go there, physically check that list, and they can immediately provide you a list of uh, manuscripts available there. And uh, I think if they approach the Malayalam department, if they are fortunate, they can locate the Pushwatham Nayaks. No one who's there, I help me. I am trying to develop us to locate that. So once we locate it, I think we uh, are. Yeah. He likes uh, the lab case. Yes. So we cannot. Uh, but I think uh, we have persons who are smaller in the department, so this will be. We have only 15,000 families. 15,000. 15,000. Two volumes prepared by Dr. Pushwatham. Uh, that, that's what, the, that is the descriptive item of only selected items, not the. Um, yeah, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the is 